He won a silver medal in the 1992 Olympics for Ireland and went on to capture the WBC Bantamweight title. Still today, he is the only fighter from Ireland in the history of boxing to win a WBC championship. He is Wayne, the pocket rocket McCullough. Welcome to Title Unboxed. With more than 40 years of experience in the fight game, our host, Doug Ward, will be covering every corner of the ring as we get comfortable between the ropes. We'll talk with both the lesser knowns and the legends, discuss boxing's rich history and current state of the game. We'll also look at today's latest innovations, equipment breakdowns, and insights you won't uncover anywhere else. Join us now as we take a look inside Title Unboxed. Wayne, thank you for joining us on Title Unboxed. Good to be here. Okay, I kind of want to start from the beginning with you because I know heading into the uh, the 92 Olympics, you had a pretty extensive amateur career. Fought the likes of Joel Casamayor, Arturo Gatti. I mean, that the talent pool was pretty deep back then. It was, you know, I, I, was, I started fighting since I was like seven years old. Had my first fight when I was eight years old. And by the time I was 12, I had over 100 fights. <laughs> 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 you know, I got the make my first Olympic team at the age of 17. And that year I got to fight, you know, with a legend, a tour Getty, you know, he was a hero. And off when I became, nobody even knew I fought a Getty until a few years back there. Somebody realized I fought Getty. I'm like, well, I don't really go up boasting about what you know, I fought and stuff, but you know, the, all of a sudden the fight popped up on YouTube somewhere. You know, I, I stopped him on like three, the first round, I gave him yeah. three standing. And we actually changed, Singlets as well. So that was a bit of history there. We changed singlets. So cool. But just to show, I say I was a fan of his when I turned when he when I came over here, and um, it's something to boast about because it was, it was a hell of a fighter as an amateur and a pro. Absolutely. So how you ended up with Eddie Futch after that? You after you won the 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 silver in the Olympics. Um, how did that happen? How did you end up moving to Vegas and and hooking up with Eddie Futch? Well, the funny thing is you say, everybody will say, when you won the silver, I would say to people, but I lost the final. <laughs> <laughs> it's all in perspective. And now, but you understand, when you win a medal for your country, whether it's gold, silver, and bronze, you know, especially in Ireland, the, you know, when I won the silver medal in 92, the last time you won a silver medal in boxing was 1956. So we don't get that many in boxing. And let's say, so people remember forever. People from Ireland remember where they were in 1992. <laughs> if you're sure. over the... 15 or back then, then they remember where they were. But, you know, when you get the, the medal for your country, you know, everybody remembers forever. And um, I say Eddie Fudge, he was 82 years old. He had Riddick Bowden camp. He had Mike. And that, he had a look at me and he decided to kick me on. And I was like gobsmacked because I knew who Eddie Fudge was as a, as a young kid, you know, yeah. back before huge. On Wikipedia, you could, you could watch, you could read the magazines, and then you get some of the old fights. And I, of course, I knew who he was. So I was honored that he actually took me on at 82 years old. And that's why I ended up, I went from, from Belfast, Northern Ireland, right straight to, to um, NDLA for my first fight. Now I flew to Vegas the next day and met up with Eddie. Yeah. What, what a transition. When he had a whole team, right? It wasn't just him, it was him and Thel Torrance and Hegemon Lewis and Freddie Roach, I believe. Uh, did you work with all those guys? When I first walked in the top rank, um, Thel was there, um, Hedgeman Lewis, and Freddie was there. Freddie, I always I was joke with Freddie because Freddie, I didn't know who Freddie was. I just, I didn't know who he was because you know, we didn't really get to see his fights because you know, your, your world championship level, you get to see fights once a week, maybe on, on, on TV at night. But he gave me a jump rope and... And I said thanks to him, and I didn't. And I said that because I went with Freddie in my last like couple of fights, and I said, "Freddie, I, you give me a jumper. Do you remember? You didn't remember?" <laughs> I said, I walked up, you know, give me a jump rope, and I, I walked into that gym top rank back then, and everybody was looking at me like, like it was like a, a Rocky movie, like a piece of meat. <laughs> yeah, everybody wanted to bar me because I just walking in there, young kid, head down. But I traveled the world fighting, like I say like big names like Getty and stuff in the amateurs. So I wasn't, I wasn't frightened or anything, but they all just looked at me and wanted to spar with me. And I'm like, that's okay. But Eddie, Eddie had, um, I had to, and training just to, 
get me through always. And he had a, I say he had a good backup, Fell Torrance, um, Hedgeman Lewis and Freddie Roach. And then Freddie, that year, Freddie left and went and started his own gym. So that was just, when I first met um, Freddie, then he, he was gone. And then Kenny I came on board later on, a few years later. What a brain trust, though. I mean, what an amazing, um, you know, group to have around you and learn from. It is, and I think, I'm not saying you have to be a boxer to be a, be a trainer or coach, but you have to have some sort of knowledge. You know, Eddie, Eddie was a, a boxer who ended up, had, he had fights and he got a heart murmur, but he was taught by a guy, and the guy he was taught by was taught by somebody. And, you know, you don't have to be a fighter, but you have to learn. It's almost like you have to go to, you have to go to college for four years to get your degree, you know what I mean? So, sure, yeah. And with Eddie Fudge, Eddie, Eddie, on my wall over here, Eddie, I'm the only fighter he gave a, a certificate to it, to be a coach someday. I've got it framed up there beside his picture. And um, That's great. I'm the only fighter out of the mall. Because I, I was close to Eddie up till he was about 87, 88. He, he, he could still get around. But then my daughter was born, and he, he loved me bringing my daughter to see him. And I was right until he passed away. And his wife yeah. actually Eva, she was up here on with three weeks ago with Joe Fraser's daughter. Oh wow! She wanted to meet me, so that was the connection still there. You know what I mean? And, yeah, and of that's course, fantastic. He fudge, Eddie fudge when she came up. <laughs> but <laughs> I was you know, fortunate enough to have Eddie have a look at me from the Olympics and decided not to retire to take me on instead. <laughs> yeah, that's a huge move. So I mean, and you you had said that somewhere that you, you don't think anybody could have taken you as far as Eddie did. No, it's like, you, know, you watch soccer, you watch soccer, Premier League football in England, you know, the best team over there, Liverpool, of course, but, um, <laughs> you know, they need a good coach. The football here, the, the Patriots for my team as well. Um, the only, you know, every fighter needs a coach. You don't think you need a coach. You might have talent, you need somebody to bring that talent out of you with the right, the right preparation, right training. And a lot of fighters have talent, but they end up not making it because they don't have somebody to bring it out or they think they know everything. And with Eddie, oh, his, his, I thought I knew everything. As an amateur, 14 years as an amateur, two Olympics, world championships. You know, I got a World Cup bronze medal. I got a Commonwealth gold medal. I got an Olympic silver medal and traveled the world. When I came here, I didn't know anything. You know, it was like, Eddie never changed my style. He, he just turned me into a pro, hands up, chin down. A lot of defense, defense. Because I was an offensive fighter, he had to get me to roll my head and slip in and block him. And he did that because, I say, I never touched a canvas amateur or pro. Yeah. Jim, I never touched me. T- time I fell on the canvas, but I tripped over something. <laughs> <laughs> well, he, and he was, I mean, he was the preeminent strategist. I mean, you talk about somebody that could... Could, could sit down and look at opponent your opponent, dissect his weaknesses, exploit those weaknesses, uh, and mitigate his their strengths. I mean, he he really grasped that probably better than any trainer in history. Yeah, that's the, the difference in being a trainer and being a teacher. Yeah, I want to be a teacher. A lot of there's plenty of trainers and coaches in this business, but but you're, as you said, they're ready to sit down and dissect and watch things. He sent me down with me and, and we did that. And at the beginning, I was like, how did he see that? I don't see it. <laughs> and then he's like, just look at the way he's doing this or he's trying to do this. And then I'm like, oh, interesting. And then I started to say, with, with training my fighters today, I can actually look at, I can look at a, a fight and see the guy's strengths and weaknesses, what you can do to him or what he's trying to do to you. And it's a matter of looking a little bit deeper into the, into the fighter or the, or the fight. And I couldn't do it at the beginning, but Eddie, when Eddie teach you how to do that and people look at this how do you have to be how can you be taught just to watch something i said you can you believe me you can be taught just yeah. by looking at the difference in movement and, and the footwork and the skills and they say i got to do that with eddie and and i got to sit down with him and he taught me that <laughs> so like i said it's like going to college and i i got i got to graduate from eddie fudge school of boxing <laughs> Good, good, good schooling, good schooling. So, and it, 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 it worked well because, I mean, in, in two and a half years, you were fighting for the world title against, uh, what's the guy's name? Yaku Shiji? Yeah, Shui Yaku Shiji. Yeah. <laughs> That's a tongue twister. It is. <laughs> we had a master plan, I say, 
I was busy. I, my first year as a pro, I had, I had, I had actually I had my first seven fights in 16 weeks. I went from four rounds to 10 rounds in 16 weeks. Wow. And, and then I fought for the NABF belt in my 11th month as a pro against an undefeated Puerto Rican who was 10, 10 yeah. wins one. And I, I knocked him out in the seventh round, got the NABF, put me in the top five. And then after 15 months, I fought a former world champion who was a hell of a fighter, Victor Rabanales. Yeah. He went on to fight for the championship after that, but it, that was one of my toughest fights in my career. But he, after that, I was number one contender after 15 months. And at WBC, I wanted, I'm not, I'm not running any other belts down, but my goal was as a 15 year old back in Ireland was when I see Muhammad Ali with a green and gold belt, I said, I'm Irish, so I need that green belt. <laughs> <laughs> it matches. I, I waited for, I was 15 months when I became number one contender, but the, the champion wanted to um, make one or two defenses more. And they, they paid me some step aside money, which is, we were willing to do it because I, I was still a novice in the pro game. Yeah. So I waited for from June of, of 94 until July of 95 before I fought for the championship. But I, but I fought two fights in between, one against a former world champion. So I, I took risks as well. But I knew in, with being in the hands of Eddie Fudge, any fight he took, he knew I was comp- confident of me winning it. And um, that's why I left everything in Eddie's hands. He, he picked the fight for me. I didn't even ask any questions about it. He told me what I need to do. And I, I, I did what he told me to do. Well, and you and he must have been confident because you went into uh, his hometown, Japan, to, to, to win the WBC uh, championship. Actually, the, probably the first, was that the first WBC championship ever won by uh, an Irishman? Yeah, well, still, I'm still the only Irish male to win a WBC belt. Mm-hmm. Eddie Taylor um, has won the WBC belt since the last couple of years. But I'm the first, still the only one to do that. But I'm going to Japan. I didn't know at the time. I didn't know until about seven or eight years ago when a kid called Ram from England fought in Japan for the championship and lost. Yeah. We said on, on, I think it was like Sky TV or something, they said, well, Monroe's going to, he's trying to become the second fighter from from the Britain or Ireland to go to Japan and win a world championship. I didn't realize it was the first. <laughs> <laughs> Guys graduated from England and never and came back with, with no belt. So to say it of Britain and the whole of Ireland, I was like, oh, I didn't even know. They never told yeah. me at the time. Hide it from me. <laughs> <laughs> they, they didn't want the added pressure, you know? Yeah, but we went to Japan. The preparation was right. Training camp here. Went to Utah for training camp. For, for like a month, then we went on to Hawaii, stayed in Hawaii for like a week, and then on to Japan. But in Japan, they treated me they treated me really well. We stayed in the Hilton, Nagoya Hilton Hotel, and Yakushi was from Nagoya. So I, I fought in the city as well, and he, he was making the fifth defense of his world championship. And as I say, the odds were stacked against me, but Eddie was, Eddie was just so... I just... I know I keep coming back to Eddie, but the confidence he had gave me... So much comes that I thought I could just knock on a wall. Yeah. And um, going into that fight, I was I was the underdog, of course, but the game plan was perfect. And they had two American judges and one judge from Korea, which we weren't mm-hmm. too sure. And of course, when they announced the decision, I really I really couldn't understand. It didn't I never got to hear I'm the new. I was yeah. in Jip. But I heard Makala and um, it was a split decision. Two American judges give it to me by the right decision, like eight, eight rounds to four. Yeah. And then they gave it against me by one point or something, something like typical. But yeah. he was a hell of a, one of the best Japanese fighters of all time. Yeah. And he fought again. I would have fought him. I would have went back there for a rematch because he was only 26. But I heard he had problems with his management and he just decided to retire and become an actor. Wow. <laughs> and back there and I think pretty popular with her to this day. Well, you had to dominate that fight, and you, you really did. I mean, you dominated the exchanges, you ended, you started them. I guess a, a taller, lankier, bigger fighter, actually. He was taller than me, but I think he's about 5'8". Yeah. And the game, I said, the game plan before, we practiced with the sparring partner. Yeah, he had a good jab. His jab was like, pers- pers- like consistent, consistent. Yeah. But Eddie had me jab, and like, I demonstrated just... But he jabbed at me. I jabbed at angles, the gap, with angles, with the body, with the head, and then come over the top. 
And he, Eddie had me slipping that jab and getting in close. And with Yagashishi, it was working. Work. Yes. The truth is, the first 70 around, I'm thinking, this is actually easier than I thought. But I'm thinking, that. So I just used that jab when I was, I was out jabbing the jabber. That's the game plan that he had. Yep. Take away from him and you out jab him. And we did that. And say the last two rounds, I knew Yagashi was going to pile the pressure on because I was, I was well up in the scorecards. But I still moved, I actually moved around a little bit in the last round, just sort of, I knew it was in the bag and, and they couldn't take it away from me. But the, as I say, he fought till the end. We took his best weapon away from him and we got the, we got the decision. Yeah. Well, and people talk about, you know, your aggressive style and how you took so much, so, so many punches and all that. But you did have a good defense. You had that kind of elusive slipping from the waist and uh, made him miss a lot of punches. And actually, I mean, it was really prominent against Brendall, your your first uh, defense of the title. I mean, he was, he, was, he was pretty much just trying to survive and jab and move, but you made him miss a lot. It did. And I say, Eddie was almost frustrated about that when the media, you know, Commentators were saying, oh, McCullough, I did have a good chin, I must say, you know, I think Ring Magazine gave me the best chin in boxing in 2001. Does that mm-hmm. mean I could hit? <laughs> but I did this, 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 and catch it or roll it and roll. And when I hit that one shot, they say it gets hit too much. But Eddie just kept, yeah, I have Eddie on, like on a documentary, he said, no, he doesn't get hit. He's, yeah, he's doing this and he's doing this and rolling. And if I'm, if I'm going forward and you throw four punches and I block three of them, I'm doing pretty well. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, and I say, unfortunately, when you're when the commentators are commentating, they don't see that. They don't see just catching or doing this, and yeah. you're head down with a punch in the up here. You know what I mean? So they never got to see that. And I say, my defense. I never got credit for my defense being an aggressive fighter. As I say, who never who never got dropped. If I'm aggressive, and I get hit pretty easily on the head, even though it's a good chin. You still get dropped. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Well, I think if any of the, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank well, it's it's a good example of of, of, a, of a strong defense. I think if any of the viewers or uh, listeners go back and watch those fights against Johnny Brendel and um, Yakashizi, <laughs> you, they'll they'll, <laughs> they'll see a good example. It's a good it's, it's a good lesson. All Johnny Brendel, he was actually the first guy I hated. Really? Because he, he was a former champion at, at 115, moved up to Bantam. And um, he was tall. He was like 5'10", I don't know, he was really tall. But he, he disrespected me at the press conference in Ireland. He, he ripped up my poster right in front of everybody. Like, really? I want to get this guy and knock him off. I want to get this guy. The referee, the referee and the five Mexican referee told him about three times, you need to start fighting, you're running, you're running. Yeah. Five or six punch combination. And they stopped it. I, I was... I was so wanting to hit him even more. <laughs> what round? You stopped him late in the fight. What round was it? Round eight. I just was chasing. Oh, yeah. I had blisters on my feet. I was chasing after him. And it was in my home city of Belfast, Northern Ireland, sold out arena. And I just wanted to impress people. And, and I did a good job because they were all, he went on to fight Polly Ayala. And he get, he get robbed in that fight here in Vegas. I remember that. Yeah. And then he the the BA Bantamweight belt as well. And then retired. So two guys beat him, me and Polly. So it's not a bad scalp to have. He was 27 when I fought him. Right. And how many, how many world champions fight undefeated guys in the first defense? You know what I mean? Yeah. So I did well, that and did everything the hard way, but it was worth it. <laughs> yeah. Well, and after that, you, is it after that fight, you moved up in weight, right? No, I had one more defensive against Jose. And, um, my goal was to say I wanted to fight for the championship in my home city. It didn't happen because Japan has plenty of money. They won the purse bid. First defense in Belfast against Jenny Burrell. Second defense four, or three months later in, in Dublin. Okay. And the reason I was Belfast is my home city. But Dublin is where I spent and fought most of my amateur fights because that's where the national stadium is. So I wanted to, I wanted to pay back my home, my home fans and then the fans from the whole country. And I did that. I, I, I defended against Jose Luis Bueno. And after that fight, I moved, I moved up in weight. Yeah. So why did you do that? You just couldn't make the weight anymore? There was better competition? And I mean, all the big name guys that were in that upper weight division were, you know, the Zaragoza, the uh, Eric Morales, 
Prince Nassim Hamed. I mean, all those guys were, were, you know, more money guys. Hey, Warren, but I also had, you also had Jenny Tapio just below me and Danny Romero, who were actually going to say, they're not saying, when I say below me, I don't mean they were below me. I mean, they were below the weight division, 115. Right. And then Jenny was, became my good friend in the end. But um, I sparred with Danny Romero one time. He was a great, great kid. But they were moving up too. So there was great fights there as well, but they had that rival against each other. Yeah. Yeah, Saragoza, you know, you had Morales was was a new guy coming on the scene. And um, Junior Jones was around. You remember Junior Jones? Yeah, stuff I like Poison. So, yeah, there was fights to get me and Junior were supposed to fight each other after the Zaragoza fight. But oh, really? That's an, it's, that was my first controversial, of course. But I'm not talking about that yet. <laughs> <laughs> but they, after I won, when you win a championship of the world, that's your dream. But then you have to think, Okay, what's next? What's what? You've reached your pinnacle. As a 15 year old, I wanted to be champion, and I reached my pinnacle. And then all of a sudden, I wanted to be a three time world champion. And um, I say, when I lost to that, goes to that fight. It was the most heartbreaking, disappointment yeah. thing. I moved off from bantamweight. I was still a champion actually that night. As once the bell went that night, my belt was vacated. And um, it was still the bantamweight champion. He was a super bantamweight champion. Once the bell went, we were fighting for his belt. Because I wanted to hold on to my WBC belt as long as I could. <laughs> yeah. And, and Jose, Jose Suleiman, you know, was, was great to me. He really was. And I say Mauricio today he took over and he's, he's always nice to me as well. Yeah. So talk a little bit about that Daniel Zaragoza fight. I mean, it was, it was a little bit of a war. <laughs> no, he was Daniel Zaragoza. You know, first of all, he was 39 years old. I was 26, and I say we had the master plan worked out again. Eddie, Eddie, we worked trained and we up in Colorado and training camp over Christmas and New Year with the snow. <laughs> but they say snow one day and then it was seven degrees the next. Yeah, <laughs> but everything was done perfect. You know, you're sacrificing Christmas, New Year's, but that didn't, it didn't bother me because I was like my my life was a boxer. And then Boston, of course, it's like fighting in Belfast or Dublin. And uh, we thought we won the fight. You know, it's safe. And um, Eddie, the, the day died, thought I won the fight. The referee, well, was, I think it was Tony Perez, his wife actually gave it to me. She was a judge. Really? And he told me back in the bus, he thought I won the fight. When, when the referee tells you that, it's like he has no investment in any fighter. Yeah. And he, he told me that, and I just, I was disappointed. You know, I was yeah. completely disappointed. And I remember flying back to Vegas and at the airport, and some guy came up to me, and I think he was, whatever, I don't know what he was, some famous guy, or I don't remember really. He told me, I was disappointed. He said, great fight last night. And he said, you won that fight. I'm like, thank you. So when you <laughs> Hard to hear. And I was there, he said, we're good, we're good buddies. You know, I got him to sign the, the love we fought in within the last couple of years and stuff. So we got fight of the year. Yeah, so be, we got a big plaque for it, and um, didn't get a rematch. Well, you get if you get fight of the year in the first fight, you're got to make a award. You're going to fight a trilogy. Yeah, you know, it didn't happen. Didn't get a rematch. Didn't get nothing. And let's say he went on to fight one fight in Japan and one, and then he fought Morales, and he was actually getting the scorecards again in the Morales fight, and then he gets dropped. That and, and he just sat there like that and just sort of wanted to get the morale as if I'm passing the torture, which is was understandable. But he was actually a hit. But as I say, I don't understand to this day why me and Zara goes out didn't fight three times. We could have fought three times. It would have been a great trilogy. Yeah. And unfortunately, for, you get fight of the year, you fight a, you, if you get fight of the year, you fight, a, you fight a rematch right away. It should have happened, but it didn't happen. But I say, no, there's no bad blood there with me and Daniel. He's a, I say he's a Hall of Famer, great guy. And um, there's no shame in a loss, you know what I mean? It's like, yeah. just, it was a learning experience for me because I was disappointed. I think I retired that night for about 12 hours. <laughs> <laughs> I remember, but I remember one thing. It's, you, know, you know what it's like when you're champion of the world and how many people you have around you? Yeah. And that, I seen that. I say through the Olympics and then at all after the Olympics, it dies down and all of a sudden you have the, the right people around you, your friends, and then you become world champion and all, all of a sudden you've got more people around you again. So I flew back to Vegas and um, me and my wife 
and at the airport, my, my good friend Julie and um, Mike McCallum, I'm at the airport. Mike McCallum, three time, you know, my wall over here, yeah. three time. Body snatcher. First thing he said to me in my pocket, you want that fight? Just get past, it. don't worry about it. But he's at the airport. He's at the airport, him and one other person, Julie. And that was, I was called smacked by that. This guy had, you know, this, this guy cared about me. Yeah, that's amazing. When I walked in the top rank the first time, Mike was the first one to speak to me. But how many guys would do that? I would do, I would, I would do that to a young, young person today. But him to do that for me, I, I just thought, I'm grateful that he actually, to this day, to him, to for him, I'm just even come to the airport. But I say there was two people there, that was it. <laughs> yeah, wow. You know, so yeah. you find well, out in the heart. It's one right. of the things in your career, then all of a sudden becomes a high because of who you have around you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, very true. So then up next was uh, Prince Hamed, right? Yes, it was. I had, yeah. I had a funny thing about me and Hamed go back till 1993. Yeah. You know, I fought in Dublin in 93 like main event he fought my undercard in 93 in Dublin yeah. <laughs> and then I say his his coach was Aries as well Brandon Ingham but I knew from that point he was never going to fight me he just he just for some reason and he fought he fought in Dublin in 1996 against um, Manuel Medina and he put in the newspapers that McCulloch he said McCulloch is scared to fight me his wife is scared of fighting I'm like what <laughs> But I seen this on, it wasn't really social media, it was like a newspaper. And I jumped on a flight, arrived in Dublin at the Guinness factory where they were having the weigh-in. And I walked up to him and said, I, I, his whole entourage, I walked up, I had one good friend with me. And I said to him, I don't care what you say about me. I said, but when you bring my family into it, you cross the line. And he was like drinking water and being all cool and all these puppets around him. And I, I poked him in the chest. <laughs> And we're standing upstairs in the, in the Guinness factory and they like, don't touch me. I said, I'm lucky if it's hogging me. And I was like, I'm not a guy, but when you see your family into it, it sort of gets deep. Yep. I got pulled off and I, I went to the fight the next day. Frank Warren gave me tickets at the, at the very back, as, you, as far as you can see. But of course, people see me there, recognize me. And then they brought me up and I sat right behind Hamid's dad the whole night and the, the crowd sang my name the whole night. <laughs> It was in Dublin, and they had posters around Ireland. Forget about McCulloch, come see the Prince. How disrespectful of that. Yeah. I was getting under his skin a little bit, but we we're two divisions apart. But for some reason, as I say, I had a layoff with my manager problems. Came back in 1998, had two quick fights. One was against a former champion, Juan Polo Perez, which had a prop in. I looked, I looked terrible in it. And um, my manager didn't turn up for the first time. I was having prom- uh, manager problems. One fight, Next, a few days later, I got the call to fight Hamed. When my wife came up to me and I remember on the bed, she said, they offered you a fight, do you want it? I said, yeah. Didn't even know what I was getting. I wanted that fight so badly yeah. from day one. But he knocked out one polo press in like two rounds. So he thought, I'm done. But he didn't realize we can do promoter problems. So the fight was done, the press conference, and of course, Flew up to New York at a press conference. My manager didn't turn up either. And um, everybody, the media, he had the media believing he was going to knock me out. And I was like, I've never been touched to canvas. But they're like, he's a big featherweight and he hits hard, he hits like a heavyweight. I said, if he hit like a heavyweight, he'd be killing everybody. Because <laughs> that's the vision. And I said, and at the press conference, Hambe was so, you know, I'm going to beat you like I'm your daddy. And I, I just turned around and said, well, you wouldn't be a very nice daddy. <laughs> And, he, um, he was twenty eight. No, well, he was twenty eight. No, going into your fight, though, right? I mean, twenty eight. He had twenty eight knockouts. He had, and he had eighteen knockouts straight. Eighteen, yeah, yeah. straight. And as I say, I never fought up at featherweight. But as I say, the media believed it, and unfortunately, got into the fight. They had me a big underdog, and then um, I said to Hamed, the only thing I said to Hamed was, I didn't get into an argument with him. In the press conference tried to get Jim to a scuffle, like yelling and screaming, like him and Kevin did, <laughs> Kevin yeah. Kelly. Yeah. But I, 
both of my wife said, don't say anything. The only thing I said to him, he stood toe to toe and you stand here, he's only a short guy. And I said, I'm going to knock you out in the second round at two minutes 30 or whatever, the second round. And I said, the first time you hit me, you're going to run. <laughs> Eddie, 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 Eddie gave the game plan to Kenny Croom for that fight. Eddie wasn't capable of getting around, but he said, make Hamid move to his left. That way he can't get the right hook on. Mm-hmm. Make if he goes this way, he gets on. If he goes this way, he can't get on. And he said, you do that, you want to make him look bad. But they made a big excuse for how many of that night. You know, I called them on about four or five times like this. I'm standing like this. Because yeah. the first thing I went like this. And that confused him because he knocked everybody out. But he ran, he ran, he ran. And then, of course, you know, you can't beat corporate. You know, I, I believe, Doug, to this day, if you want I won that fight. Because the guy ran, he ran for me, and a good a good referee back in the day will say, you know what, you better start fighting. Like the one against him fight, yeah. But Joe Cortez that night, I had whiplash, minor whiplash on my neck because he pushed me down so many times. Oh jeez! Second one he pushed me down and hits me another cut while I'm on the canvas. Like like when Roy Jones did at the Montel, he knocked him out. Do you remember? Yep, I do. Qualified. He did the same thing when I jumped up and went to Joe. Joe's like, box. I'm like, so I know what I'm against here today. Yeah. And he never got warned for anything. I don't want him to get disqualified because he, he held me at least 15 times. Yeah. Three, that's a one point deduction. Four times you're out. But you can't get away, you can't get away with anything against the, you're fighting the corporate. And to say, uh, Frank Warren and Brendan Ingle, both on video here after the fight, they, they couldn't believe my performance. Frank once said, I'm going to get a rematch in England. What did Hamed do after that? He left Engel and he left yeah. Frank. He left yeah. both. Yeah. I mean, you know, so I say the, a year later or a couple, a year and a half, two years later, whatever, when he fought Burr at, at the MGM, I get a call to go down and meet him. And I'm thinking, is this the right person calling me? I said, so I went down to meet him and we just stood and talked to each other, had a chat. And I just joked with him about, you know, you should have fought me again. Went, mm-hmm. You could have won Wembley Stadium in England. And, um, but I got him to send the gloves we fought in. The actual gloves we fought in, they're signed by me and him. Same as the Morales gloves are signed by both of us. I collect my gloves and collectors would love these. The actual gloves that I fought in with the both signatures on them. Oh, wow. So I mean, it's just Rick. He's a good guy, but he just, I think at the time of his fights, he had so much attention on him. People rubbing the sweat, people giving him water, people doing this, people doing that. And I think at the end of his career, realized where's his friends? <laughs> yeah, well, it was a little bit of a circus around him. It was a hell of a fight. He was, he was actually good for the sport. He was just so talkative. And, and, but as I say, I, I was based in America. When he came to America, you know, he fought Kevin Kelly. Great fight. He knocks Kevin out, but a great fight. Yeah. Then, or, or me, and then he fights for her. So when he came to America, he realized it wasn't as easy as it was over there. You know yeah. what I mean? So yeah. A lot, a lot different. You, you learn the profession over here a, lot, a little bit harder. Yeah. But fight him, you know, he's a legend as well. So. Well, and you and you picked right up after that fight and fought another legend in Eric Morales. I think you also, I think he was also on a winning streak, on a knockout streak too, like nine straight Knockouts or something, and yeah, but I mean, you it, broke but that it, string. Yeah, I'm fighting. I fought Yagashiji, number one in the bantamweight division, number one ring magazine champion, and then um, then I moved up the featherweight and fight the number one guy. Yeah, then I dropped back down to super bantamweight and fight the number one rat division. And the Morales fight was the Morales fight for me was actually enjoyable. If you, it's hard to stay enjoyable when the guy's hitting so hard. Yeah, but. <laughs> No, Morales, Miguel Diaz is my good friend. He's his cut man. And he arrives in Detroit. How many was the main event that night against Cedar Soto? It was a terrible fight. I mean, Morales was the second fight. But I walked over I to, that. At, at, at the hotel, and Morales is standing beside him. And I said, hey, do Miguel. And I turned to Morales and said, come and stand, Miguel. And he looked at me like, as if to say, you're not supposed to do this. <laughs> <laughs> we did it, and then Chris came and Morales is like, like broken Spanish. He's like, I'm going to do to you what Hamid couldn't do. I'm going to knock you out. And I'm like, I just went, 
No. Nope. He's like, you can laugh if you want to. I'm like, uh oh. <laughs> so we get in there and of course say uh, the first round I went out. On the, officially on all the scorecards, I took the first round away from him. Mm-hmm. And Connor told him to back off, back off, because he couldn't try to push me back and then he ended up being the boxer. We stood toe to toe for 12 rounds. It was close. He won the fight. No, it's no question he won the fight seven rounds to five, but no more. Seven rounds to five was, was a close fight. And then one judge scored a 10 rounds to two. I'm thinking, I wasn't even turned up. Come on, seriously. Yeah. No, the sad part about boxes, judges like that need to be took away. And, and fought again. Yeah, true. I, Morales was sitting in the ninth round, landing on the stuff, <laughs> black eyes, and ready to quit. Miguel, Miguel always says to this day, he forced him more or less to get back out there. I wish yeah. he would have quit. I wish he would have quit because in the first round, he was cracking me hard. But in the 12th round, he was still cracking me as hard. But it was a fun fight for me. And I say, I go into his dress room right after the fight. I, I'm ready to go out to watch the main event. Make, or, um, I'm in, and I'm just normal after a fight because I can go 12 rounds. I can sprint for 12 rounds. I go into the, he's sitting on a massage table with a big jacket over him, sitting, make a shiver. And I'm like, are you okay, amigo? Are you okay? And he just stood up, took off his jacket, took off his tracksuit top, and handed it to me. Oh, that's cool. I've never had that done since amateurs do that. We, we change like singlets. Yeah. So yeah. I give him mine and I say, I've got that. I actually came across it actually yesterday. Like the funny thing is, out, out the back and signed. He signed. I got him to sign it a few months later as well. And the gloves, cool. the gloves we fought in, I got him to sign them as well. So the respect we had after that, I say, was great. And even up and up this year, actually, I, I, we talked to each other on on WhatsApp. And then I said, Tommy should do an exhibition. And he's like, Yeah, yeah, that sounds good. But um, I have to lose a bit of weight first. <laughs> I said to him I tell you what why don't you come to Vegas and I'll train you to fight me <laughs> well you know what they say about your enemies yeah no but that's what I mean uh, the morales is it like he went on to move way up and up the world weight even like he, he didn't belong great but he was from bantamweight to like lightweight he was he was fantastic but he was even at, at the world weight division he could still compete but he was sort of yeah. But I say the the, the shoulder ring these guys and, and they say the same to me as the shoulder ring with you, but I just look at them guys, you know, hell of fighters and a fighter doesn't look at themselves as a, as a, a great fighter, do you know what I mean? Or yeah. a hockey guy. But you're right, I have had eighteen knockouts in a row and Morales had nine knockouts in a row. So I broke their knocker or their knockout ratio. Their, yeah. <laughs> broke the string. Of, don't mess with the Irish man. <laughs> <laughs> So you, you went on and fought, fought after that, but what, what made you finally retire? What was the, kind of the, like, what, for you, what was the, the indicator? You're like, eh, I probably should give it up now. Well, the thing, the truth is, Doug, that, you know, when you're past your, sort of past your sell by date, you know, when <laughs> I was up and coming, you had, you fought everybody. I'm not, not, not disrespecting any fighters today, but, you know, I won the NFL against an undefeated guy, puts me in the top 10 or something. Then I had to fight Robin Ellis to get the number one spot. Then I had to fight for the championship. I wasn't like, guys are getting shortcuts in here and back around. And with them, um, I just wanted to fight everybody. And I, I did say, you know, Carl Frampton, you know, the kid who just retired from Ireland. Yep. You know, friends, he, I'm his hero, actually. But um, he, he said, this year, he actually said, Wayne McCulloch's the best Irish fighter of the last 30 years. So for him to say nice. that, nice, because as I say, for him to, from me to his hero, I, um, I thank him for that too. But so I just wanted to be the type of guy who fought everybody. And he, he said that, well, win or lose, he said McCulloch fought the best in three divisions. Yeah. Not just the, the second guy or third guy, but I fought the number one guys in the three divisions. And... That's Hall of Fame status if you look at it that way. But, you know, I'm in Hall of Fame here in California, but Canastota, for some reason, hasn't put me in. They've got Zadagoza in there. They've got Hamed in there. And, of course, Morales will be in there too. But, you know, Yakishiji should be in there. But there's a lot of politics there. Sure, sure. So I won a world championship first ever from Ireland to win the WBC belt. That stands for some right, right alone. And never lost my belt either. So 
Well, and I think a, a glaring difference between fighters of your era versus some of the fighters now is you, you're in it for accomplishments. You know, like you say, when they said, do you want this fight? You're like, yeah. You didn't say how much and, you know, ask all the questions. It was like you were in it to, to achieve things. Yeah, my targets today is more or less, you know, maybe fight once a year, twice a year. Well, I'm not kidding. I'm not fighting. You know, I just... Money comes along, of course. You have to make a living in your pro, but sure. But to love the game, just to, to do it, you have to love the you know, the training, the the fighting, you know. And and I did that. I say maybe I cut myself short in fights of you know my manager, you know Matt Tinley. You know I came here for him. He was my man. I was the first fighter he had, and then he screwed me over. Yeah, and a lot of money, like close to a million dollars, but. I, I, I still made a bit of money, but I could have had I could have had more. But but I was taking advantage of that way. But at the same time, you have to love to fight. You have to just love to get in there and and that's part of it. You know, I did 14 years in amateur for free. Got to see the world for free, and didn't get paid any money. So that's different. You have to you have to enjoy it. Even as a pro, you have to enjoy it. And some part of it, no, you have to enjoy that. Money comes along and say, but you have to enjoy it. And but I always but I do teach fighters today to be more be smart. You know these managers are trying to take advantage of it. I try to teach them, watch for it, watch what they're doing. Don't say yes to everything. Just make sure you're getting what you you deserve first, and then say that because with my mistakes, I can teach these guys to keep their pockets filled. I say keep your pockets filled as much as you can. Well, it's, it's great. It's like not only do you bring the, the boxing knowledge of having had your own career to your fighters now, you also bring that financial side of it. You know, you know, you, you know what they need to do to keep to keep keep some of their money and uh, benefit, not walk away from this sport broke. Yes. And I say every fighter, we just love to fight. When you're just starting off, you just want to fight. And that's part of the problem that then they're took advantage of because not saying all managers and promoters are bad. I'm just saying they see that you're you're like blinded in the light. Yeah. Light. So you're not really worried about oh you're getting this much. The certain fights I had, like I was getting a hundred grand, and my manager would cut me. And then I like, oh we can't pay this much. And I do it. Do you still want to fight? Sold out arena in Ireland. Paper or not? American TV, British TV, Irish TV. And he's cut me down on money, and I said, yeah, I just want to fight. Or I just should have said, oh, I'm not doing it. And right. then I would have. But that's the mistakes I try to teach my fathers today. I'm going to say three quarters of them listen, but a quarter of them still don't listen. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going to say boxing, I've said it for 15 years, boxing should have a union. Yeah. We're one of the richest sports in the world. When it comes to a big mega fight, you go Mayweather, Conor McGregor. Look how much money that generated, probably a billion dollars around the globe. Yeah. And you're trying to say you can't take a small portion of that away to put in a pension. Small pension, a small part of a purse. If a guy gets $1,000, if you take $50 away and put towards his pension, even just $50, if you make a million dollars, take like a couple of grand away. To, you know, there's different, the guys who are making a million dollars don't really need a pension in the end, but the smaller ones that are making this, this, we do. And as I say, football have it, baseball, basketball and stuff like that and soccer in England, then why can't boxing do that? Because they don't want to. Yeah. Well, the promoters and managers and the guys that are taking advantage of the fighters will never let that happen. No, I want to say my first fight was in LA, my third fight was in LA, and they took a part of my purse for the pension scheme. I thought I didn't miss it because I didn't see it. Yeah. I was like, I think my, my pro debut was $6,000 back then. It was pretty good money back then. And he took it like two hundred dollars from. But about five years later, he ended up giving it back to me, saying nobody would participate. Like, mm -hmm. but if he just took it out and just let take it out of everybody's purse, yeah. But the big boys don't need the pension, but yeah. the middle all the guys do. Yeah. And yeah, having that at the end, because your career is over, you're still young. Yeah. And a lot of boxers don't really make anything. And they end up, they have no qualifications, they have no trade. So what do they do? Yeah, do drugs. There is. Drugs, 
their fan base is gone, their entourage is gone, and they end up dead. Yeah. Well, the, no, there is there is a life after boxing. Yeah, but nothing after boxing. As I say, most people f- boxed back then. Came from ghetto, you know, have no education, stuff to get. I came from a ghetto in Ireland, of course. But I say today it's different, you know. People always say you can't be a fighter unless you're from the ghetto, but that's untrue as well because the generation, you know, I have a daughter who who, who can fight, but she's not, she's not a boxer, of course. But I said to her when she was younger, 14, do you want to be a boxer? I can train you, you know, you know, I want to be your coach. And she's like, no, it's fine. She sings, she's a singer instead, so it's better. <laughs> yeah. But, <laughs> but she's not from the ghetto, but she understands what the value of the dollar. So yeah. because you're better, it doesn't mean you can't be a fighter. You know what I mean? Because the next generation, yeah. other kids, they're not from the ghetto. You know, so his kids, I'm sure they're going to be, if they become fighters, they're going to be great fighters too. So there's, when people say, oh, you, you can't be a real fighter unless you're from the ghetto, I'm like, yeah, that was back then. Yeah. Second generation of your blood is going to be not from the ghetto because you want to do better for your kid. So that's not true that way. Yeah. Well, it, it is great that you've chosen as your life after boxing to give back to the sport. You have a, you have your own fighters now. I want to talk talk a little bit about that. You know what what did what did Eddie Futch and that team instill in you? What are the philosophies, their ideology ideologies that you're passing on to your fighters? The first thing Eddie, you know, taught me was actually was actually during one of my fights, they did like a documentary piece in between rounds. They showed a video of Eddie talking. And he said to him, what's the, f- the thing you want to do with your fighters? He said, well, the first thing I want to do with my fighters is, is become the fighter's friend because if you're the fighter's friend, friends do the best thing for each other. Well, most of... <laughs> yeah, you'd hope. <laughs> I thought that was like true because you're he's your coach, but... If he's your friend, a true friend, he's going to do the best thing for you. As I say, Eddie was the type of guy who didn't care about money because I always use the example of, you know, Montel Griffin's my great friend, but the rematch with Roy Jones and Riddick Bowe, the rematch with Galata, the disqualification Galata gets disqualified twice. Yeah. Eddie didn't want that fight them to take the rematch. We walked away and fell, fell, worked a corner with them guys. And you know what happened? Same, Galata did the same thing to Bowe. He got disqualified, but he beat the crap out of him. Ugly, then, ugly fight. Yeah, and Montel goes out and just blasts out in the first round. Mm-hmm. And felt Eddie wanted to more or less have two defenses, make the same money, and then get out. But that, that's, that showed me what Eddie was about. He didn't care. That was big t- paydays for Eddie. But he walked away from it. Yeah. And just showed the, the type of person he is. He, doesn't care. he didn't care about the money. He cared about the person. He so he wants to be the fighter's friend. But if somebody doesn't listen to you, then there's nothing you can do. And with that, you know, he taught me that. And I can, I, I try to be, you know, my the friends, the fighters, and advise them to do the right thing and do this and do that. And to say you get 90% of them listen to you and the other 10% don't. That's always going to yeah. be like life in any business. You're always going to get them small, oh, listen to you. And then what happens to them? They get screwed over. Yeah. No. So Eddie taught me that, not just about boxing, about life too. Yeah. Well, it, it, again, it's fantastic that, that that lineage is not getting lost. You, you, we lose some of these great coaches, and they take everything they know along with them if they don't have somebody like you to pass it on to that can de- then teach the next generation. Yeah, with, with Eddie, Eddie talked, we were at the fights at the dinner table, he talked for like yards. Like the stuff he was telling me is unbelievable. Yeah. But he, just didn't work in the gym, get a fighter, and he got a world champion. It was, you know, he had guys who were good, guys who were contenders, and then he gets his first world champion. You know, then all of a sudden, he sets off. It's, you're just, it's almost like you're only as good as your fighter, don't we? Yeah. And today it's more about, oh, he's training this guy because he's a champion. Most of the champions go to these trainers at, when they're already champion or, or they're not going right. from, he had, Eddie had me from day one. Yeah. How many how many fighters can actually say that? No way. Floyd, his uncle and his dad. But apart from that, people jump ship from here to here to here to here. Like, and then they got. I'm not. 
disrespecting coach, but they have a coach who doesn't know anything, but they're in the corner. To me, that's just like a, I think they're just paying them 2% or something, not even 10, 10%. Yeah. You know, Eddie, Eddie, Eddie got 15% from me and he was well worth that. Well, right. worth it. <laughs> guys cry about 10% today. They cry about 10, 10% minimum, but they'll pay their money five to 33%. Percent, you know I mean? Right. And boxing's changed and not for the better. Yeah. That's right. Last week with the, the two women um, last Friday night, what do you call her? The American girl defended her belt against the French girl. Um, she's a world champion. You know, girl. Get her name. But they, I was at the fight at the Virgin Hotel the day before the big fight. There was nobody there. It was empty. Oh, really? Fight of the year. Yeah. Fight, fight of the year. Stood up. Ten rounds nonstop. Yeah. That's fight. You're back to boxing. I mean, yeah. and two women were the main event. That night, um, it was unbelievable. It really was. Yeah. We need, we need fights to gather, like a tour gathering, Mickey Ward fights, Corrales Castillo fights. They're the, they're the modern day fights. Go back to Hydra and Hearns, and we know the greatest figure out in boxing history. So it's fights to gather, bring you, brings you back to it. Yeah. I mean, and, and when you see a dull fight, and you're like, mm. then you see a fight, oh, he won the fight, and then the, the other guy gets this. Oh, I just see that. Yeah. No, if, you're right. We need, we need some modern day classics. We do. We need modern day classics, and I say that that women's fight last week was a modern day classic. Women, which is yeah. women can fight, and say they brought it last week, and they that's a classic rematch, probably a rematch. Well, well I, I think sometimes they fight harder because they feel like they have more to prove. Probably yeah, because I say they did, they do two minute rounds, mm-hmm. and truth say they can do 12 three minute rounds, no problem, because the Olympics was. For, the women were doing three twos, now they're doing three threes, which is what they should do. Yeah. Why they the women do hundred meter sprints, four hundred meter sprints, eight hundred meters, fifteen hundred. Why can't they do twelve threes? They can do yeah. twelve. Women tell me they can. I trained some women amateurs, they can do it. Well, I, I think it'll get to that eventually. I will get to that. We'll definitely get to that. Yeah. Well, Wayne, it's, it's great talking to you again, catching up, sharing some of your stories with our listeners, our viewers. Um, appreciate the insights and some of the, some of the history there. Uh, before, we, before we close out, t- tell everybody where they, can, where they can follow you and keep up with what you got going on, your fighters, uh, your social pages and that. Well, social media, I'm terrible. My wife does it all, but I went my click, you know, you put the pocket rocket in, you can see that too, like your shirt as well. Yep. But my pocket rocket shirt on. <laughs> But I, Wayne, Mc, uh, Wayne McCulloch on um, Instagram, Twitter's like a thing of the past now. I've got the Instagram. Yeah. And uh, I think the guy that you can get in t- contact with him. Yeah. I do personal training online too, like Zoom and stuff like that. So you can always contact. And uh, I have a new thing coming up as well called Live Train. Me and Mickey. I'm glad you brought that up. Yep. The Live Train. It hasn't been launched yet, but me and Mickey Ward will be the guys of it. So. There you go. One of my fighters is not going to my garage. <laughs> well, good timing because we're wrapping up. But appreciate all you all you brought to the sport and uh, continue to give back. I want to say thanks to all the fans. I hope you remember me forever. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you for watching this episode of Title Unboxed. If you're anything like me, you can never get too much boxing. So if you'd like to watch more episodes, you can find us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and our Title Boxing YouTube page. <laughs>